Ready. All right. Thanks for coming to Spine Conference. Today we're going to review posters from the Academy, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery annual meeting uh, in Orlando, which was last week. And there's maybe, I don't know how many posters, maybe 500 posters to 1,000 posters. And um, the posters that I um, was interested, I took some, uh, some photos of some posters and I want to review them today with you. So um, the first one will be, uh, can occult infection be demonstrated in the setting of pain in patients who have undergone spinal surgery? So this is from HSS. This is an interesting study. And the hypothesis is uh, you do lumbar fusions in some people and they have persistent pain. And the question is, are they infected? Um, so what they did is these are, these are patients who had a previous spinal fusion with screws and everything was normal, sed rate normal, um, Y count normal, C-reactive protein normal, no evidence of infection on x-rays, uh, and no fevers, so no, basically no evidence of infection. And um, th um, they took the patients uh, for revision surgery. They didn't explain what exactly revision surgery, what the diagnosis was, but there was 42 adults went revision surgery, and they cultured the screws, or the, the area around the screws, and they grew them for 14 days, which is longer than usual. What's the, what's the typical growth, like three days, Aaron, five days? Three to five days, I think. Yeah, yeah even animal. Depends on the bug. Yeah, and what they, and if you ask for it, but typically they don't do it much past five days. So in these cases, a third of these people grew something, and so 37 percent um, colonization. And they also did um, histological specimens to prove that it was an infection and just not a contaminant. And the most prevalent bacteria was Pro Propionibacterium. Acnes, uh, and the average time for the bacteria to grow out was five days. Um, so it took a long time for these to grow out. So if the average time for, to grow out was five days, you know, you would have missed some if, you if the cutoff was five days. Um, the other interesting statistic um, amongst the uh, positive cultures and the negative cultures is the people who are positive, uh, much more likely than men are positive, three to one. Uh, and the time between the index procedure and the revision was four years. So these people were, in general, four years out. So this study proves basically that um, when you're doing a revision lumbar surgery, um, there's a good chance at four years out that there's a 30% chance of patients having pain that they're infected, which is very interesting. So you can have these chronic indolent infections on implants that just are sitting there in the body. So any questions or comments? So should we take cultures when we do a revision? Probably, yeah. We probably should. And so that we can give the patient the appropriate antibiotics. We should. Every time we take an implant out, we should culture it. And let it grow so out. You can tell them to grow it out. Inflammatory changes in the tissues. You said there was no evidence. It of looked like an infection. symptoms of fever, et cetera. No, no symptoms, so no symptoms. No symptoms. So just the presence of bacteria in these areas. Now, how does it cause pain without causing inflammation? Uh, was there inflammation? It's unclear why they had pain. They could have had no. pain for another reason. I mean, it's not, they didn't prove that the pain was caused by the infection. No. But these people wanted <coughs> surgery. I mean, people who are normal don't want surgery, and they don't come to the and doctor. The, and the source of the uh, bacteria surgery the skin. Probably, yeah. Like any surgery. Was, these all, was this all lumbar? They, the, they didn't say if it was lumbar or not. They didn't say. Where did the study come from? HS, uh, Hospital Special Surgery in New York. Oh, yeah. So, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, you work for Time Magazine. What, are you, what is this? My kids are. Uh, I just put a bunch of pictures of Donald Trump because my, my kids are fascinated by him. That's all they talk about. Okay. So next, uh, next article is um, cervical spondylitic myelopathy. So basically patients' cervical spine necks and they have pressure on their spinal cord and they have surgery. This article is from uh, NYU and it goes over complication rates and can you predict um, how these people do basically for a cervical spine spondylotic myelopathy, so uh, by definition, problems with the spinal cord and neck. Um, and uh, it also analyzes um, what they had before the surgery. 
So these were cases of one to two level surgeries and not uh, grade one spondylolisthesis. So these are not severe cases basically, and they're not very big cases. You're just one or two levels. And the non-operative treatments pre-op, these are 203 patients, the average age is 57. Um, and they presented with neck pain, arm pain, some rare uh, motor deficit, uh, not too common, reflex deficit, not common at all. Uh, and uh, if you look at the bar graft, um, a third of the patients had analgesics, non-steroidals, and physical therapy. Those are the most common non-operative treatments. Um, so the total complication rate for these cases was 7.4%. And the most common complication was a CSF leak. Um, the only risk factor for developing a complication was a previous surgery, and that increased the complication rate nine times. So it's a huge number. So uh, this article basically um, just went over uh, the risks, the uh, complication risks is 7%, and the, the, the most important one is previous cervical surgery, which increases your complication rate nine times, which is a huge number. Um, and the other thing is they measured uh, the um, disability index and patients did well. Their quality of life improved from the surgery. So any questions about that? That include anterior and posterior cervical surgery? Uh, didn't say. Okay. Didn't say, but I assume it's all anterior. <coughs> Could be posterior too, actually. I don't know. If you had posterior and then had anterior or the opposite, does that increase the risk? Whether, is there, are the risks higher posterior versus anterior? No, if you had one posterior, one anterior surgery and the second was posterior, does that change? They did not say in the poster. Sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. We're paying attention. Yeah. No, no, these are good questions. Next, no. yes. Is that because you're doing so, so much uh, manipulation with the tissue? And, uh, <coughs> what, why does why why do they that, have that happen? Is this more revisions? Why revisions have a ninefold increase? Or yes, in this la last paper, it's just mm, the probably tissue, the, the tissue is scarred, scarred. Yeah, scar tissue, yeah. not a good, not as good a blood supply. Maybe mm. durotomy, durotomy. longer yeah. surgery, longer surgeries. Yeah, more com more complicated. Maybe older patient, perhaps, mm -hmm. because they've had it. Now I'm not sure. They didn't go. They didn't dive into the. The, the, with more information, but who who got complicated? Yeah, I, the, the take home, the biggest take home was, if you've had previous surgery, it's a ninefold risk, which is a huge number. Of course, in the intervening period, your underlying disease process progressed, so that may be. It could be if you're farther along this process. But most likely, that's what it is. Okay, so next the case, I found kind of interesting is from the University of Virginia, and it's following uh, fusion surgeries in patients who are super obese, super obese. So that is, that is a BMI greater than 50. So a, greater, a BMI of, is, is of greater than 50 is a very big number. It's basically five feet, my height, five feet 11 inches and 360 pounds. And it's fusion, lumbar fusions. So I've only done one case of a lumbar fusion greater than BMA. BMI of, my record is a four fusion is BMI of 45. Um, so I've never done a case this big, um, a fusion that is. I mean decompression is, but fusion is difficult. And here are the results. Uh, across the board for myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular accident, pneumonia, DVT, urinary tract infection, transfusion, durotomy, infection, revision surgery, they're all higher. Uh, for the super obese. So they break it down in non-obese, obese, morbidly obese, and super obese. And the DVT rate in the super obese was 6.5%. UTI was 21%, which I kind of found a little interesting. Why do they get urinary tract infections? Billy. Huh? Hygiene. You're, hmm? They can't Hygiene? Hygiene problem, I would think. Clean. For women, they can't get down there to clean? Or? And men. Yeah. yeah. Are they lying in bed first off longer with a... Probably. 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 Uh, transfusion is, is uh, obvious because the surgery is probably longer. Durotomy is the same, so there's no increased risk of durotomy. Uh, infections, 14%, which is 
uh, double the morbidly obese. And revision fusion is 5%. Actually, it's not that high. But the biggest number I found was uh, urinary infection. It was very high. So um, it was very high in the uh, morbidly obese, 13%, and the obese, 10%. I was going to say, for most categories, it goes up. Yeah. But um, I mean, my take home from that article is I have a very high suspicion of uh, index of suspicion for urinary infection post-op. Just watch these people and tell them you may have a urine infection. And you have to call me right away if you have it. Did you make a case for uh, weight reduction surgery with the pain Yes. Definitely. Um, so any questions about that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a dumb question, but you mean accidental durotomy. durotomy. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so next is um, cranial vertebral body dimension increases with age and male sex. So the, well, the question is, does, do our bones change as we get older? Do, does like the vertebral bodies, do the, the, the dimensions change as you get older? Because some bones do change. And what they did is they uh, reviewed the CAT scans of 60 people as they've gotten older and broke it down into decades after the age of 20. So 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. And they measured the bones, front to back, height, and width. And this is interesting because we, we do surgery, put screws into spines all the time. And the most important one, I think, is depth, which is the first bar, the darker bar. And you see the depth is just over 15 millimeters, about 16 to 17 millimeters on average. And they get, the bones get bigger as you go up to C7, which is obvious because thoracic bones are bigger than cervical bones. So did it, uh, the heights um, got a little bit taller as people got older? Um, especially C7 and the depths got a little bit bigger and the widths got a little maybe about the same again C7 is the bigger the biggest so very small increase in the size of bones can you can you think of any uh, anybody come up with a reason why bones get bigger as you get older just like the femoral shafts become stovepipe they get wider the bones the bones get weaker and as a result of that to get stronger they get larger most people get shorter as they get older. They lose their discs. But the bones get bigger, get, get wider and thicker because the larger surface area, because they don't have, they're not strong. So they spread the, sur they spread the pressure over a larger area. They spread the force over a larger area so the pressure goes down. So it's a natural inclination. As people's bones get weaker, they get bigger to deal with the stress more. We see that in femurs. So it happens a little bit in the spine, but not too much. So the take home uh, for Brian is never, never, uh, give a screw that's bigger than 17 millimeters, <laughs> okay. right? Because very few people are over 17 millimeters in cervical cases. Okay, this is another kind of interesting case, um, sacroiliac fixation in children with neuromuscular scoliosis. So it's basically the base of the spine. You have to have a strong fixation point, a strong screw. And this is a new way, it's a newish way to do it, where you stick it through the sacrum and then it crosses the sacroiliac joint, you see the top left, and then it goes into the ilium. That's a really big screw, so you get a really strong anchor point. It's really big. Oh, and, and this is from Hopkins. I just did one of these. Did one, yeah, it's probably the, yeah, the Hopkins. So the way you insert it is between the S1, S2 uh, dorsal uh, foramen, and then you angle it uh, towards the anterior inferior iliac spine. And you can get a teardrop x-ray to, uh, to, to make sure your angle is in the right direction. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, so it goes through the SI joint too. And I think the benefit of this screw is that you can see how it lines up. The typical place to put it is in the ilium, which is off lateral. So it's, it's easier to put the rod in. You don't deal with that futz that we always deal with to connect to the iliacs. That's the only reason to do this. So what I, the case I did with the surgeon at University of Maryland. Just remember we're on the internet, so everything has to be uh, public. Um, his choice for this procedure on that specific patient was because he had planned secondarily to come back and do an SI fusion after right. the posterior. So his attempt was to eliminate the need for that by using this technique to see. Well, putting a screw across the joint doesn't fuse it. I know. It's like a... In fact, it can cause pain. A lagging. Right. doesn't fuse it. Basic question, are screws always metal? 
There are some polyglycolic glycolic acid screws. You sell any screws that aren't metal? No. Polyglycolic acid screws in sports cases uh, with that self dissolve. But they're not very popular because um, they're weak. They're usually titanium because they're MRI compatible. And it's sort of plastic that might have some bendability as opposed to metal. It's done that with rods, but not screws. Yeah, not screws, yeah. Okay, keep going. He's making a point here. So this is this is in uh, this is an article. Hmm. Hmm. This is C two. Um, this article is. Um, hold on, sorry. C two. The C two dome decompression preserves C two attached muscles and affect uh, activities of daily living disturbance of cervical alignment uh, after laminoplasty. So let me just tell you what that all means. Um, this is the back of the neck. And the muscles that go to C2 are really important. And this is um, this is most described in the Japanese literature because they do a lot of posterior cervical surgeries because Japanese people have a lot of ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligaments. So they've studied this the most. So they found that if you remove the muscles to C2, the neck gets really weak and it can't you can't hold your head up, and you get kyphosis. This is not this X-ray is not from a C2 problem, but this is from a child who had a post laminectomy kyphosis, but it gives you the understanding that the spine can become severely deformed if you weaken it from the backside. So these guys, what they just studied, if you decompress C2, how will it, um, in a certain way, are they affected? And I'll tell you the certain way. They followed 31 patients that had a C2 decompression in their, in the ways that they did it. They did a dome decompression and they did a tunnel dome decompression. I'll show you. It's a special way to do it. And they wa looked at the patients for range of motion, lordosis, activities they live in, neck pain. And uh, they had 31 patients, and they all had laminoplasties, uh, but they had these C2 decompressions, and they controlled them to uh, control groups who did not have anything at C2. So this shows you the type of decompression on the top. The first top is the dome decompression, where you just, you just uh, leave everything on C2 intact. But then you go right underneath it and you decompress it. You can see there's a there's a corrective prop, there's the lesion. So you can see you leave the muscles intact on C2 and you just decompress it this way. This is the way that I always do it. The, the, have I told you that? That I do it like the dumb decompression? I probably didn't even say it. I just I've never but you, that phrase, but that's yeah, but that's you. so you leave everything intact on C2. But let's say the lesions above C2, like, like in these lower cases. So what they recommend is this tunnel where you, where you do the dome and then you go from the top and you leave the musculature intact to C2 and decompress it that way too. So you open up the area for the spinal cord but you leave this floating bone where the muscles are attached and eventually it all scars in and the neck stays strong. So the, the issue is don't detach the muscles to C2 if you, if you can help it because uh, it makes a big difference. And then they, uh, the results are basically the patients did the same. So this, this uh, technique of uh, dome decompression and tunnel dome decompression is effective in uh, maintaining your neck alignment and, and uh, postoperative pain. So it's a, it's a retrospective um, analysis. But I found it interesting because I do it. But the tunnel dome I've never done. So that's another, if I have that case, I'll think about it. Before I do a tunnel dome, me, I'd rather just do uh, laminoplasty. I'd rather just crack the bone open and let it score down to the lamina. That's what I've done in the past, but it's an option. Can you see the picture of me? Yeah. Because I'm not quite sure in the top row how taking that little bit of bone off makes any difference to the width of the... See how the, everything will float backwards, though? See, if you, if you remove that bit of bone, there's more room, and if everything can float backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't look smaller on the picture. Well, they didn't draw it correctly. But yeah. there's, there's, I mean, the, the spinal cord is only 10 millimeters. All you need is a couple millimeters. That's all we're asking. It doesn't take much. It makes a huge difference. So I know it sounds uh, minuscule and insignificant, but when it's your cord that needs a millimeter, it's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's it's kind of how life is. And these uh, details can be very important. Yeah. Okay, so here's Donald Trump's happy. So this is uh, from Brigham. This I like this article. This is um, from Harvard. It's basically patients who have lumbar discectomy, how long do you have to tell them to decrease their activity level? 
because what happens is um, you people can have reherniation. So you do a discectomy, people can have a reherniation, and the rate is somewhere between five or ten percent. So a lot of doctors say you can't do anything for for three months. You have to just nothing, and you can't work nothing. And there's other doctors like me. I say just for a week or two, take it easy, and you'll be fine. And I've just I don't know where I came up with that, but I just I don't know. I just it's my it's my thought process. So these people actually studied it, randomized controlled study, two weeks of decreased activity versus six weeks, in patients with lumbar discectomy, just a one level lumbar discectomy, simple cases. Um, and they studied them and um, they did it randomized. Uh, and he, here are the um, the results and who they were. But basically, the reherniation rates were the same. And the reherniation rates were about six to seven percent. Uh, they didn't say whether they had surgery, and the outcomes were the same. So, and they also studied the disc and whether he did any lonomy, none of that. The disc herniation, whether he did any lonomy, where the disc herniation was, it didn't change the outcome. So the basic, the basic uh, finding was, um, you don't have to tell people to decrease their activity level for six weeks. Two weeks is plenty. And uh, and I think it's important because. Um, People want to get back to their lives, <laughs> you know. Like, like people, people. I think I don't, I don't like, I don't like keeping people down. I think they should just go back to their life. Do, do your work, do your job, do your sports, do your activities. You're not a patient anymore. You're a normal person. So I think it's important. Okay. Next case is uh, I like this. Next poster is good. Does does number of drug reported drug allergies affect patient reported outcomes following lumbar spinal surgery? So this just studies allergies. So it's been found that allergies are directly correlated to depression and anxiety. Number of allergies, that is. Um, so they, this is a, almost 1,000 patients, and they followed their outcome after surgery. So these are their reported allergies. So the vast majority of people had no allergies. <coughs> and then a lot of people had one allergy, not so common, two. But it's very, very rare for someone to have 10, 11, 12, 13, 20 allergies. So they studied these people, and they found that the number of drug allergies significantly increased um, disability. So it goes from 20 to 35 percent if you have over five allergies. And how um, is the disability measured? Was it self-reported? Self-reported, and. Um, because people with anxiety and depression are more likely to report it, so maybe it's not pleasant. It's a, well, the, that's the whole point is, mm -hmm. let me just, we'll hold that Sorry. thought for one second. No, hold this, it's good. Hold mm -hmm. that thought for one second. So it just shows that everybody did get better, but the people with more allergies just on baseline were hurt more and then afterwards hurt more. And also the number of allergies was directly proportionate to their depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. which was also studied. So it was, it was a direct correlation if you had greater than five allergies. So, so the issue is, as a doctor, it's very difficult to ask people if they're depressed or have anxiety because there's a social stigma involved. They don't want to talk about it, but they will tell you how many allergies they have. So we can use this as sort of like uh, a vehicle for us to know that patients have depression and anxiety because it's important. And they show that there's a direct correlation. So the number is greater than five. So I, I thought this was very important. I'm trying to picture an orthopedic surgeon doing the psychiatric <laughs> My interview is, are you depressed? And when they start crying, they're like, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. <laughs> that, that's a, Trump doesn't know what to do there. So this is outcomes and revisions following <coughs> multi-level ACDF, so anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So, this is a poster where they reviewed patients who had a three or four level anterior cervical fusion. Three or four level. And ha they haven't really been studied. That's, that's many levels. Um, and these are 46 patients and they looked at their disability and their outcomes. Um, and this is the Oswestry Neck Disability Index. It's what they gave patients, self-reported. Pain intensity, personal care, lifting, reading, headaches, recreation, sleeping, driving, work, concentration. And they studied these patients and they found that 35% of these patients at two to three years time needed another surgery, so a third. And 
four percent, only four percent had adjacent segment disease, which goes against the studies that people say people need disc replacements because there's a lot of say, adjacent segment disease. They were mostly for non-unions, 24 percent non-union rate. So the conclusion is if you have a three or four level ACDF, there's a 30 percent <coughs> chance that you may need another surgery for non-union. And this is the bottom you just show a non-union. The CAT scan proves that the bone's never healed. And usually the non-union surgeries, you go in the back of that and put more bone in there, which is not a big procedure, which uh, I have not found my rates are 30% at all. My rates are probably like 10% or 5 or 10%. But this, this article showed us 35%. So the more levels you do, the greater the chance that one won't heal. So any questions about that? I thought that was good. What? I'd like to see the before peak versus allograft. Okay. Improvement of back pain after discectomy. So this is this is the article where they where they reviewed discectomy surgery uh, for sciatica, and then they they followed like did their back pain get better? So the theory is when you do discectomy surgery, uh, the sciatica gets better, but people still have back pain because the disc still hurts. And this is articles like does the back pain get better? So basically they studied low back pain after discectomy and does it improve? And there were 77 patients and they found that. When they did discectomy surgery, these are simple disc cases, not revisions. When they did discectomy, 60% of the patients had improvement of low back pain at two years. So that's pretty significant. So, and 70, 82% had improved sciatica, which you expect. So the, and, and I found this to be true too, is that when people have sciatica pain, they also have back pain, both get better with discectomy surgery. Not everybody, but a lot, 60%. So that was a good article because it, um, it explained that. And they they followed minimally clinical important difference. I just say that because of MCID after pain and function. You can see for for back pain is the solid dot, and for leg pain is the square. They did get improvement, not as much as the sciatica. And um, same thing uh, here for uh, average change. There's improvement, but not as much as the sciatica improvement. So. It, uh, you do help people's back pain with uh, discectomy type surgery. All right, and the um, next is vancomycin failure in high risk surgical patients. So, mm -hmm. this is an interesting thing: is when we have a high risk spine case, uh, many people, including me, put vancomycin powder in the wound, and it's found to significantly decrease infection rates by inserting vancomycin powder. I know you, people at first were like, they didn't think it was it was, a, it was not true, but it's been it's basically been proven. Uh, the staph aureus, very powerful staph aureus. So this is this article is like, how often does it fail, and what happens when it fails? So um, this is the the um, the failures. They did 500 cases with vancomycin, 600 controls without it, and um, the control group is uh, blue and the um, the red is vancomycin. So a lot fewer infections with the vancomycin powder. Um, and the, their uh, high-risk cases were diabetics and revisions. And they found um, um, it, it, people still got infected with vancomycin powder, but it was decreased. Um, but it did help decrease the risks, um, but they didn't grow any super bugs, um, and um, they needed more surgery, but it, it did help. So you can see here this graph, like blue versus red, it did help uh, putting the vancomycin powder. Red is the vanco group, but they still got infections. The most common one was uh, methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus, which is basically what everybody gets. But MRSA was significantly decreased. The first one's MRSA. You can see how how it really helped with MRSA. And these are high-risk people. Okay, this is the last one. This is a. Um, triangular model for congenital cervical stenosis. So basically some people are born with a small tube to their spinal cord. You can see the MRI, there's, um, there's two different MRIs. See how the one, the one on the right, area for the spinal cord is much larger than the one on the left. And the people that are born with these small sc spinal canals have problems because they have no extra room. So the question is, let's look at these people and what actually is small? So they, they went over uh, 462 MRIs, 
and if you had a mid sagittal diameter of 10 millimeters or less you're included in the study and you have to be young less than 50 years old um, and there's 15 percent of people meet that criteria the mid sagittal diameter for the spinal cord is less than 10 millimeters at a young age and the key um, difference is are two things and you can see on the right the MRI that's a, a normal canal and on the bottom is a small spinal canal and you can see how there's very little room for the spinal cord so the two measures were the pedicular laminar angle which is which is right here the angle between the pedicle and the lamina and then the disc laminar angle so this is across the disc and the lamina you see those two angles so those are the angles that are different in people with a small spinal canal um, and they get bigger and they're large, larger respectively. Um, so people with small spinal canals have a smaller laminar pedicular angle and a larger laminar disc angle. So you can see the, the shape of the spinal canal um, is tighter. It's like the, it's, um, it becomes more like a straight line basically instead of a large area. So I don't know how to explain it. Maybe like a short pyramid. Like is it looks like you don't see how that's like an inverted pyramid? Or tri inverted triangle? It's a it's a short triangle versus a tall triangle. That's the biggest difference in the shape of fifteen percent of people. So I, I thought that was interesting because they used to say short pedicles, but it's not just the pedicle, it's actually the shape of the pedicle and the lamina and the vertebral body. Um so that's it. Those are all the posters that I found interesting to me. So any questions about the, the Academy posters? Those in Orlando. So there must have been a million of them, though. I'm not sure the exact number, but they're like, uh, like at least 500. And, um, and they're very good. And it, it's nice for you because you just take your time and you look at all of them and there's other people and you talk about it there's like groups and you go with your friends and you talk about it together and huh. you don't mind talking because you're not in the auditorium you're just in a big space so the posters are very popular